Several years ago, well-known Nephilim expert Steve Quayle broke a story about a giant that was killed in Afghanistan. And he had an interview with the pilot that flew the giant's body out on a C-130 aircraft. The story was covered on the net and on Coast to Coast AM with popular radio host George Norrie. Back in December of 2008, L.A., Steve Quayle was on the program, as he's been so often and he brought us that pilot anonymously pilot did not want his name disclosed and he talked about this very bizarre story of how he flew this dead giant out to some base in ohio D describe exactly what you saw well when we came up uh, basically came outside uh, we had a normal uh, 463 l pilot loaded down with uh, what they told us was a giant for l.a the nephilim has been his life He's done hundreds of radio and TV interviews over the years on the subject and received an honorary doctor for his research. Researching and writing about it since 1988, Watchers 10 is the culmination of those years of research, exploration, interviews, and lab tests, proving these facts are real without the worldwide cover that has actively been concealing the truth. Watchers director Richard Shaw also has done a myriad of radio and TV interviews on topics ranging from the Torah codes to UFOs. On one of those interviews, he spoke with a caller who was in special forces in Afghanistan back in 2002. After the show, they talked for a long time, and it became clear that this was one of the men that actually shot and killed the giant. Then later, L.A. happened to meet another special forces soldier who could confirm these stories. Neither of these men wish to reveal their identity. We film them in remote locations because of their military backgrounds and the sensitive nature of what they're revealing. But both felt it was imperative to finally tell the truth. You were in Afghanistan in 2002, and you were called into a very remote section of Afghanistan because a patrol um, had basically gone missing. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. Exactly. Well, we just ran around nothing for miles. Right. Like very, very remote. remote. Yeah, very remote. So we flew in. Did about four clicks, kilometers. We're hiking through the same area where they were supposed to make one of their checkpoints, you know, one of their rally points. And before we'd left, there was all kinds of what happened with the ambush. But that was even odd because at point of ambush, we'd call for maybe close air support, something. Okay. There was no calls made. We just off the, off the bridge. So we're coming down a, a mountainside, and it was a nice, nice path, a goat path. As we bent around this corner, you could see this opening of the cave. There's a cave as we're coming around. And then I see there's a lot of rocks, which is another oddity, and then bone matter. When I'm not close enough to identify what kind of bones, but I did see something I knew was a piece of our communications equipment. So instantly, we're thinking ambush, maybe animal, you know, it could be anything. And there was enough room in front of this cave, but it had a sheer drop off. But there was enough room that we actually got into a decent dispersal in case of ambush. You see something coming out of the cave, and it's moving with a speed and agility that catches you off guard. Everybody. Everybody. And he comes out. It was a man at least 12 to 15 feet in height. This is a monster, red beard, then his hair was long past the shoulder, a scarlet red, and Dan runs at him and starts shooting, which broke all of us into the reality. Because it was so, so now, real. now your training is kicking in. Oh yeah, okay. muscle memory, right. complete muscle memory. While Dan is moving at him, another bro of mine's laying down fire and I start firing. He skewers Dan. He's now got him on this pike. It went through. And he's still got him. And he's coming after more. We all just clicked in. I don't know what it was, but I remember we're all like, shoot him in the face, shoot him in the face. Weapons components were in four. We had 308s and we had Barracudas. This is sounding longer than it took. We're talking 30 seconds. And he's taking multiple hits. 
and it's still moving. He talked about this giant being 1,100 pounds, anywhere from 10 to 15 feet long, uh, and it was killed. It was uh, apparently shot uh, somewhere in a cave in Afghanistan, uh, and uh, but before it was shot, it lunged at uh, several of our troops, our soldiers, it may have even gorged somebody. Uh, it was just a bizarre, bizarre story, and it just sounds like the Nephilim from the Bible, doesn't well, I, it? I, we, that's why we're so fascinated by this. Why? If people have a right to know about this stuff. I mean, if, if there are 15-footers or 18-footers ro roaming the planet, and our military has brought them down, I mean, we have a right as American citizens. I mean, this isn't classified military stuff. This is something that we need to know, and it points back to the biblical prophetic narrative. What are your thoughts on that? I think, uh, here's, here's my personal opinion. My personal opinion is if it points that the Bible's accurate, they don't want it. Uh, if it goes against our winning evolution, it's not to be spoken of. So you're out in the boonies running around looking for high-value targets? Correct. Okay. And we're doing those operations and uh, as we're getting into firefights, we're getting into different uh, scrimmages, you want to put it that way, we would come back to the base and we started hearing this rumor about a unit that killed uh, this, well they started calling this really tall person. At first I didn't think anything of it, and come to find out that the uh, person that they killed actually was three times the size of a man, had extra digits on their hand and digits on their feet, and had red hair, and uh, a special unit had come in and wanted this uh, target. Well, we'd heard that they were had killed this thing inside a cave, or the mouth of a cave, and uh, it was common knowledge among the military to hear this. And when you say common knowledge, what do you mean? I mean, how does that work? Years later, to come to find out when I had returned from Afghanistan and had met other uh, military members that had not been there in the operations with me, uh, if you would bring up the giant of Kandahar, they knew about it. When you first hear it, you're thinking like, this is, uh, this has got to be a joke. This has got to be a hoax. But then after things go down a certain way and you keep hearing it, you start to realize it's, it's not a joke. They kept telling us to keep our, our weapons high which means normally it's two to the chest, one to the head, but they kept telling us to put it towards a man's head and put it higher. So we would question why do they want us to shoot higher than a man's That's head? That's bizarre. So it is. Our contact said 2002 is when they had they shot this this 15 footer or taller. And you're now in, in, in this, you know, in the service around 2005. This word has gotten out. And what I find interesting here too is that if you're going to create a hoax, I get that, but you've got details, six fingers, red hair, double rows of teeth, six digits on the toes, and of course that brings it right back into what we hear about in the biblical prophetic narrative, specifically the Nephilim. Your thoughts? I, I agree. Uh, I will tell you that uh, when I was doing my time in the service, and the stuff I saw, some of it I couldn't uh, explain like lights in the sky during firefights, like orbs or uh, lights looking the size of a, a softball that look that size looking up in the sky but making weird noises. And, and even going to Iraq myself and, and being near Haditha Dam and knowing, seeing the prisoners underneath the, the, the dam and the prisoners would scream and there'd be this awful feeling underneath the dam and then later finding out in the Bible that um, angels locked underneath there were talks about. And this Haditha Dam is the Euphrates. Is Euphrates, and correct. An angel supposedly locked underneath the Euphrates. Correct. Which is released in the book of Revelation. That's correct. That's bizarre. So you're at the Abdus site and soldiers are being locked in prison underneath the Haditha Dam, Correct. and they're freaking out. They're freaking out. They said they could feel it. In fact, the uh, people who would guard them would, uh, they would draw straws to see who would actually take them. No one, no one wanted to go down. Nobody wants to go down. Going back to Afghanistan, we would hear these things. We would hear the locals talk about rumors of these giants. What would the locals say? How would they talk about it? They say that they lived in the caves and they would eat people. And uh, they were cannibals. They were cannibals, and we at the time chalked it up to our United States as Bigfoot. And we realized that every culture had some kind of folklore, but to actually all of a sudden hear that a military unit had killed something. 
and, and you have to assume that the giant is not alone, that the giant is not the only being living on this planet. There's got to be a whole school of them somewhere. Uh, you know, maybe he's got a female uh, mate. Maybe he's got children. Who knows? Um, unfortunate that uh, he had to attack our soldiers rather than uh, be somewhat peaceful. But uh, I guess that comes with the, uh, with the territory. Dan was dead. Okay, and uh, why is a good man, probably one of the best men I know, now dead? Before I'd left, they were already starting what they call a nine line, which is a medevac request. They're sending out a medevac request, then all of a sudden it's not a medevac request. All of a sudden we had a helicopter show up, because like I told you, it was a large precipice and a sheer drop. So the helicopter just came up from the drop. They had dropped netting, which is like uh, cargo netting. It's like squares. We were told we had to bundle him up. And we get another bigger helicopter. But it's almost like a jolly green giant used to look back in the day. That could get, you know, through this area. Because the mountains, you gotta remember, Chinooks could only go in certain places because they had enough lift. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we got him on there. The thing was too big. We couldn't move it. It smelled worse than a skunk. A corpse that's been around for a while really fell. Oh, it was like a combination because of the, how do you put that, the persistence of a skunk smell, but once the helicopter came in, dropped its little hook, and off he goes. The communication was sent out that we had a very large possible human creature. There you are in the, the hills of Afghanistan. Uh, how many troop members are you with? We had uh, six on my crew. Uh, and when we say hills of Afghanistan, uh, for us, we did not fly into the wilderness. We actually flew into a base. Uh, I guess this thing was transloaded out of the uh, mountains by a C-47. But I could see that it did have the six fingers. I remember taking my foot up and placing it up next to its foot, and it was extremely large. We estimated at about 12 feet, give or take. Uh, what I can tell you is the weight of the thing, basically, it was approximately 1,500 pounds when it was getting on the aircraft. Now, if you take away the pallet weight and all the rigging that we had to uh, hold this thing down, we figured it was around uh, 1,100 pounds. Of course we're upset. That's a given. Okay. We lost a very good guy. But add to that, <clears throat> You're discussing something that, even in our after action report, they're saying rewrite it. And we had to rewrite it the way they wanted it. How, how many fingers? Six, six oh, six, six, six fingers, toes. Six, six toes. toes. And the nails were weird because if you see somebody that ever has, uh, I don't know what it's called, but it's like, like a fungus, on, fungus the on the nails, how they get pointy and they're like gnarly, that's, that's what they see. look like. I'm going to show you an artifact. It's a bronze artifact. We had it tested. It's about uh, almost, you know, 98% copper, uh, pure copper, but it's bronze. Does this look familiar? I can confirm it was probably about a 10-foot pole connecting it, lashed, split pole, like I guess they would have done back in sure. the old days. Was it about this long? Oh, easily, easily. This was found in the wilds of Michigan. We have come to call it the Nephilim Lance. It is definitely not a sword. No. It's a pike, it's a lance. And what, you know, you, you put a staff on this thing, good luck trying to wield it. And what's interesting is the weight of this lance ties into the biblical prophetic narrative. Talks about the weight of, of the spearhead was 300 shekels, talking about one of the giants. I think it was Ishbi Banab. The, the giant spearhead was 300 shekels. When you convert that to pounds, that's eight and a half pounds. That's what this is. Back in 2005, I was actually stationed or deployed to Qatar. It was a completely normal mission for us. We were not alerted for anything abnormal. It was in the middle of the day. Uh, I remember uh, coming into 
a base in Afghanistan called Bagram. Back in those days, it was pretty austere. It was an old Russian air base that we were using. Um, it's basically built in a bowl in the mountains where you have to stay high right up in the last minute and then you basically come screaming back down to, to land. Uh, the area to the side of it was called the Valley of Death because during uh, the Soviet days with the uh, Mujahideen they had fired their rockets into a lot of the uh, helicopters so you could see all kinds of uh, wrecks and stuff in the valley below. Which for the most part I didn't pay attention to because I was a little busy getting the airplane on the ground safely. Uh, we landed and uh, basically was told to taxi to the very end of the tarmac. And, and like I said, it was middle of the day, very hot. I remember that. We opened the doors and unloaded the equipment that we had brought in. Uh, and then we were met at the aircraft by uh, what we later on called the babysitters. But uh, they kind of introduced themselves and said, hey, no cameras, uh, nobody's taking pictures here. We're uh, moving some high value stuff. Uh, when the load got there, uh, we're very, of course, uh, curious to see what it was because that's just the way you are when you're told that you're not allowed to have uh, a camera. Uh, they say this thing had been dead for maybe a day or two, uh, but it stunk. And when I say stunk, I've smelled dead things before, but this had a more of a, I want to say a musky stink, kind of a, not really a decay decay, but more of a, if somebody hadn't taken a shower in like 10 years type of a musty, uh, musky stink is all I can tell you. And it was basically a dead guy and this guy was extremely large. And when I say large, uh, our pallets are basically, if I remember correctly, about 9 by 12 feet or so. This guy was laying in a fetal position on the pallet. Uh, so he and he filled the pallet. Uh, we estimated his size at approximately 12 to 10 feet tall. Uh, I did see his skin color. I was expecting somebody of more Arabic descent, uh, being in Afghanistan and all. I know he was dead, but he was very pale, very white. Another thing that uh, us and the rest of the crew did was we took our feet. We, he was in a fetal position, so you could take your feet and put it kind of. You could see where his feet were there, and they were they were wrapped up. He did not have shoes on, but he had like. Uh, Looked like he was wrapping them in some kind of a canvas type stuff, but we were sticking our feet up next to his feet, and his feet were extremely big. We know that the, the standard weight on one of those pallets is uh, about 1,500 pounds, and I do remember that the loadmaster did the weights, and it was around 1,100 pound guy. The pallet sits on dunnage. You know what dunnage is? It, it's uh, basically like railroad ties so that you can get a forklift underneath it and pick it up. So it was on dunnage, and basic dunnage is like maybe a four by four. And then the pallet is, say, yay thick. It's actually aluminum and balsa wood. And uh, this guy, I mean, laying down was very, very wide. I mean, and he was, like I said, he's in a fetal position. And you go up and just, you hit it. And of course he's under a tarp and all that, I understand that. But he was one dense, he was a dense guy. Uh, we questioned the babysitters of, hey, where'd you get this guy? And uh, some of the army guys there with him uh, relayed to us that uh, this guy had, I guess, been living up in the mountains uh, next to a village where the villagers basically treated him like a god. I did infer that they were uh, making sacrifices to this guy because they said he was, they found bones of people. The giant supposedly, like I said, I was not there, supposedly killed the first team that they came across. He was extremely big and fast and agile for a guy that size. They sent up another team, and when the second team went in there to get him, supposedly he had already started to basically eat on the team that, uh, that had been killed the first time. They then grabbed a helicopter, and the helicopter brought him down where we picked him up. After we loaded the Giant, it was just a standard, uh, standard mission back. We took him all the way back to uh, Al Udeed in Qatar where he was transloaded onto a, another airplane. I believe it was a C-17. Uh, I was done with my mission then. I got away from it. I was done. I did ask some questions later of, you know, where it might have gone. And as the grapevine goes, it was probably taken back to the United States. And the words I heard were right pat. But again, I don't know. 
Several years after my uh, deployments to Afghanistan, something very strange happened to me um, that is somewhat related to this. I was uh, basically TDY to Kirtland Air Force Base, which is out in Albuquerque. Uh, I was out with my JAG at the time, and there was a uh, Navajo Native American uh, sitting basically in the restaurant that we're in. It was also a bar. It was actually Kelly's, uh, Kelly's Brew Pub. And uh, this Native American guy, out of nowhere, he was talking to us, very friendly guy. And out of nowhere, he asked me if I knew what a Native American sing was. And um, no, I didn't at the time. I do now because I looked it up. But uh, he says, I, I have to sing for you. And he put his hand on me and started a Native American prayer, if you will. And I thought, wow, this is very strange. Uh, but it was cool as well. My, my uh, jag that I was with actually took out her, uh, her apple... Uh, iPhone and started to film it and he stopped and said no no not on film not on film and he, she put it away and he sang the prayer and here's where it gets very strange he started talking about did I know that there were giants out in the Sandia mountains and he said they're out there in the mountains still and the earth had swallowed them up and he goes watch out he says someday they're gonna come back they're gonna come back I then uh, took him aside and said hey as a matter of fact I've seen these things they're real I, at least I think I've seen these things uh, and I basically conveyed to him the story. He just took it in stride and said, yes, they're real. They're absolutely real. And he said something like, if I remember correctly, like the earth had swallowed them up, but soon the earth will spit them back out. And soon, he said, soon, they're coming back.